You see what we do it for is different than most. The elements that we proceed forward with is a different type of mixture, a different type of combination, a different type of connection, man. We are the copper color. Cons. And we ain't just the color. We are the frequency. We are promised. We are prophesied about. We haven't given up yet. It takes a special type of naga. You going through this type of friction, you arose out the concrete. Con takes a special type of con to be determined, to keep the water flowing, to keep your, your feet moving, to never give up, to keep the fire burning. Con. We do this because everything we're doing is connected to the copper colored naga right here in America, man. India Superior. Whether we're talking Georgia, Bragantoni Dynasties, Kingdom of Ossetia, the Islands. Whether we're talking the Mongol, Kar, Katai, the Tang, <laughs> the Jin, the Shishia. Whether we're talking the Ethiopian or the Abyssinian, Managa, the Rus or the Russian, I'm just talking about you, man. And I think we're starting to understand. Ahab to Managa is Ahab all across the earth plain. This was our last stand. The last opportunity to coon, to fight. Under one code, not put no power before our power. No vanity on Hawa's name. Keeping our Shabbat our rest day. No killing, no stealing from each other. No bearing false witness on each other. Honoring our Ama Aba Aba. No adulterous Nagas, man. No covetous Nagas. This is our nine call. Our last opportunity to unite in our nine, our noon, our seed for our seed to grow. Right here, you're looking at it, man. War of 1812. To Tukum say, to Tukum is to rise. Did you rise? We can't rise if we don't rise together, man. So everything we're talking about in the press investigation comes right back home to you, my naga, to us, to the last noble image, which is you when you look in the mirror, but you forgot what you look like. It's been so long. Our parents didn't teach us about this ancient love song. They just raised us with a strong moral code, right? You know, how to be a man, how to be a, a woman, man. But to truly be hijacked free, <laughs> hey, that's a destination. You know what I'm saying? To truly be hijacked free is a destination we got to reach together with our parents, <laughs> grandparents, children, sister, brother, today. We're learning this, man. So we are investigating. We're seeking a why in Con David. Because they've been seeking, man. And they've been searching. <laughs> they've been seeking and they've been searching. Putting up memorials to those searching for the car to the priest. To the priest con. Who or who is pressed to job? Yeah, they uh popping off <laughs> off the coast of South Africa looking for them, right? 
This memorial, situated in Port Elizabeth, Eastern Cape, South Africa, the monument is dedicated to the mythical king, priest, Prester John. And the early Portuguese hijacked more <laughs> settlers who discovered the area. Really? How do you discover something that's already populated, man? I mean, we got to have a talk about this hijacked city. Can we talk about this? You just want us to glaze over this a million times in a row? How do you discover something that is already populated? There's people there, man. There's people already here. You're not discovering us. No, you're just finding us, right? Why don't you just say that? <laughs> the early Portuguese settlers who just found <laughs> people in this area. No, they want to say discovered the area because they want to claim the area. They want to claim the land. So if they say we discovered the people living in the area, it sounds real hijack city for them to say that they're taking it from these people. So instead they say they discover an area. Oh, and the area happens to have some savages around. Savages that you built a monument. Searching for the savage naga. Yeah, we know where you looking, boss. We know where you searching, boss. We know you searching, boss. I mean, uh, the mythical. Straits of Anya. It's a myth, boss. It was all a dream. Portuguese, Spaniards, all the same damn thing, man, right? I mean, when the great Venetian traveler Marco Polo returned from his eastern wanderings in 1295, he brought back for the use of geographers and future travelers a fund of information concerning Eastern Asia. Where's Asia, boss? Where's Asia Major, boss? All right, let's go. Which was to serve as the main source of knowledge for the next 500 years. It was thus inevitable that as the wave of Spanish exploration Portuguese swept across the newly discovered. Here we go again. They're discovering something, right? <laughs> American continent. More than two centuries later, men should instinctively turn to his pages for information concerning that mystic land of Cathay. Back to the Cathay boss, right? All right. Which it was now conceived had been so nearly reached by these newly new travelers. So they're Nearly reaching Cathay, right? Where's Cathay? As Cortez, Cortez and his followers pushed forward, however, 
into the vast regions which lay to the north and west of their first line and entry into the continent and found little <laughs> save some naked savages right if I could jump through the pages I might just be putting a chokehold a rear naked chokehold on Godfrey Sykes right now but it's all good man I don't want no trouble. <laughs> Calling us some semi-naked savages. Where oriental splendor and civilization were looked for, the first picture gradually faded away and it was at length realized that more exploration must take place upon and around Balboa's new ocean before the coveted, 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 what's the rule number nine in the nine code, huh? Thou shalt not covet your brother's things, right? Okay. So the, it's it's clear. Genghis and Kublai in there. Whether Kublai is the brother or the son or the grandson. You know, different genealogies. Same family. What we do know is that Kublai's mother was a Hebrew. Remember, you know, they took Arab proper... Uh, the genuine a rabbi they they intermarried into the house of the propers the house of king david judah so they took the mothers the daughters of judah they intermarried to get legitimate status as land inheritance heirs to the land now right because Hey, my grandmother was such and such. I deserve some of this land. Heard that before. Through the grandmothers that didn't choose that marriage, they were taken. Our aquas were taken. Come. Kublai, his mother, was taken. She was a queen mother in Judah, in the house of Dawi. So Kublai, he's half Israelite, right? He's half Judah, right? Through the mother. And this is a land that they're coveting. America. <laughs> yeah, man. Mythical straits of Antioch. We talk a lot about this Anon, right? Antioch. Hana. Go get the drop, right? So come on, we continue it. This is Presta. 117, man. 117th installment of the Preston John investigation. Call me Hano. Lahua. Before the passing of this dream, the belief that the Chinese Empire had been nearly reached had sufficed to fill the maps of the new continent with kingdoms, <laughs> rivers, cities, mountains, borrowed from Marco Polo or other less well-known Eastern travelers. So this is their way of covering their backside. And instead of finding a land full of these kingdoms, they have to call us semi-naked savages. And they can't, they can't give you kingdoms and savages, right? So one has to go. Either you are the people, you are the royals in these kingdoms, <laughs> right? Papal bull, uh, go subdue these kingdoms, but then they're going to say you're savages. Come with your manifest desto, uh, Nicholas V, putting the hijack on us to subdue us and put us in perpetual slavery. Enemies of Christ, but we're savages. But you want to subdue our kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, all our movable and immovable goods, but we're savages. It's a forked language, right? They're telling two different stories simultaneously. Either you're finding kingdoms or you're finding savages. So they have to say, oh, well, uh, this was just Marco Polo uh, borrowing the kingdoms from here, putting them over there. No, a mother sucker. You're borrowing the kingdom of India Superior. And you're putting it on your maps over there. Now you got a new China, a new Indy, a new Rus land, huh? Huh? 
hijack city. That's what you call phantoms and duplications, typologies. These were placed upon the blank spaces or fitted by eager cartographers to suit natural features described by returning voyagers. Capital, man. <laughs> Never in the history of Cappadocia. <laughs> let's go, natural. Let's go. At instance, an instance of this perhaps pardonable professional enterprise. To be found in the Rooks Royce map published in Rome 1507 and used to illustrate an edition of Ptolemy's works. Ptolemy's works. The relationship between the new Spanish discoveries in the Terra Nova and the Asian continent was not yet fathomed, but all of Marco Polo's kingdoms were placed close at hand in the northwest, ready to be absorbed by forthcoming expedition so you think Marco Polo is just placing kingdoms around here and then reporting back to Genghis Khan remember he's out the the court of Genghis Khan right just like you got King David's court you just read in the medieval histories of the medieval empire the Israelites how Afghan son of Jeremiah son of King Saul the Benjamite was still protected in the court of King David Still had a place in the in the house in the court of David, Dawi, Afghan, Afghan. We're gonna talk some more about this Middle East, this Persian flow. We definitely gotta start getting into the Zoroaster flow because you know apparently their story is that they was running from Genghis Khan too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Had to set up shop. Very interesting stuff, man. So you see it, man. Developing the idea further after the discovery of the mainland north of the Isthmus, we find that the maker of the MS map, illustrated in outline, has placed Prester John and his neighbors, idolatrous neighbors, because, you know, King David is surrounded by hijacks, <laughs> not very far from Mexico by accident because he wanted to put kingdoms in the blank spaces, boss. Or is this what he knew? Because he has to report this back to Genghis, man. He can't be bringing no wing wham back to Genghis, man. You already know that. <laughs> and Genghis has no, um, you know, this wasn't his psychological attack on the, on the, <laughs> on the Negro of America, to, so that they don't know where they're from. Now Genghis wasn't on that erasing you type of stuff. You know, what I'm saying he was on the conquering you. And the greatest of you can be in his house, can be in his court. You know, he wasn't he wasn't that unfair of a of a monarch. You know, he still let you keep your traditions. You know, he still had to respect the fact that he was marrying into the house of David. Whether by force, you know, or, you know, because they had a, a con relationship. But, you know, it looks like it was by force. All this erasing came from this Greek Hellenization and, you know, all, all this uh, so-called white situation today, right? So-called white hijack uh, iconoclast and putting their images on everything. That's kind of new. Genghis wasn't on that. He didn't mind you knowing who you were as long as you knew who he was. <laughs> so Marco Polo has to report back to Genghis. You think he's bringing a map full of capri or... Is he placing <laughs> it's hard. It's as big as they're going to give it to me? Okay, okay. Let's do it like this. Make it real clear. One more time. <laughs> He's placed Preston John and his neighbors not far from. Mexico, you think that's on some play play? I'm not gonna, you think it's play play. <sighs> it's right in your face ball, man. That's what it is.
press the job. America. India Superior. Cafe. Mexico or Pars or Paris or Persia. <laughs> All the same thing. When we talk Persia, we still talk in Mexico, man. When we talk China, Cathay, we still talking India Superior, we still talking America. When we talk Japan, we talking Zapangu, Kapangu, we still talking America, boss. This is what Marco Polo understood. He wasn't trying to fill in the blank spaces. <laughs> All right, then you got their Asia over here. And we got maps with the Asia over here. Which is why it's called Asia Major, Major and Asia Minor. India Superior, India Inferior. Huh? Preston John in America, in the British Museum, right? Circa 1530, British Museum showing connections between Marco Polo's Asia and the New Lands. Are they discovering them or did they discover us? Because they've been searching. They've been seeking. Who? <laughs> who or who? It's Preston John. Who are you searching for, Portuguese? Who are you seeking? A black man? The king of Israel? You thought he could help you? In your more and more war. He's in the middle of the more and more war, man. <laughs> he's been in the middle because he's in the middle of the promised land. He's right smack in the middle of India Superior. Cathay. That's why they're searching, man. And they want to say you from Africa when they found you in India Superior. That's crazy talk, right? Because the Portuguese are searching. They're putting up monuments, boss. To press the job. And the jabroni searching for press the job. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, you didn't know? That's who they're searching for. That's who they're searching for. That's who they're searching for. And the early Portuguese settlers who discovered the area, the monument is believed to be the only memorial in the world depicting Preston John. <laughs> what? The only monument in the world depicting Preston John, man. But he's so infamous. But why don't you want, why don't you think they want you to have your last noble image? Why don't they want you to see who you are? Why is this the only memorial depicting the Preston? A Negro. Consist of a large Coptic cross or Tau, last letter of the Hebrew, Tau, with figures 
in the central circle depicting Preston John himself and a Portuguese navigator. Con. <laughs> Is it play play? Is it play play? So where they find you at? Where they bring their boats? <laughs> you got to thinking that they brought you from here. Africa. Africa. And somehow, all you millions of Negroes in America came from Africa. Forcefully on boats. And there was no Negro war in historical records. No war that went down because of these stolen people. There was not a stolen people war. Never has there been a war for the stolen people. They just take, 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 and they get no recompense, right? No, <laughs> nobody slides for you, right? It, it, we just the easiest, simplest people to take. We ain't going to fight back. We just some good slaves. That's that's what that narrative equates to. You just a good slave. Or <laughs> were they searching, right? For this black man, right? So-called black. Who is the president? The car. In India, superior. <laughs> India superior. India Superior with Cathay in India, Zagatai and look China with China right here, Mexico right here, Mangi Mangu Khan right here, Manko Khan popping off right here, Florida right here, your kingdoms, principles, <laughs> movable goods, everything right here. Hey, Terra Fuego over here. Terra Fuego over here. <laughs> Follow me now. Tarzanta over here. I said, F uh, Follow me now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, boss. Let's get oriented, shall we? Let's press the 117. All this uncharted land is so charted. And I mean, this is the greatest, largest, super duper river I've ever seen going right past South America into Tarzanta. Oh no, it's just a little Terra Fuego. It's a little Terra Fuego. Are they gonna give us the whole map, man? They keep cutting us off, right? But we know we're in India Superior and we connect to superior lands. Why? Cause that's just the way it is. You connect to more land. And this land is so large. Look how large Antarctica really is. <laughs> All the known land you got on the so-called globe, there's double that when you talk about Antarctica. You know what I'm saying? Cause it's surrounding everything and it's so 
vast and they call it Tarzata and it seems to be a special gateway over here when you talk South America, right? India Superior. Yeah, the land extends elsewhere and you can get through elsewhere. But man, there's a huge gateway right here, right? And I mean, it looks like you can keep sliding all the way through. All the way to the other side, possibly. Man, who knows how long these go? But they're calling it Tara Zanta. Which means what? Which means what, boss? Fuego. Oh, look at this little land. They ain't giving you. Why are they hiding all this land, right? You got to, I mean, you got to use your common sense, man. You got to say, why y'all hiding all this land? Virginia, 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 right here, man. Virgin land, virgin land. You got the Moroni flow, the Mormon, Moroni flow, the Mormon flow. All this happening, man. Tarzakta. And you're like, why y'all calling this Tarzakta, man? <laughs> what it mean? <sighs> Meaning. Tara, I mean, sometimes just look it up, man. You know, sometimes you just gotta look it up. Wow! So we talk, we type in Tara and we get Holy Land. I can't make this stuff up, huh? I'm not drawing these maps. I'm not putting this story together. It's all happening. It's all connected. So when we talk Tarzata, we got Holy Land, boss. Yeah, when you talk Preston John, you're going to have to expand your mind bone. All the way to the top of your soul bone for this one. You're going to have to expand your cartography. You're going to have to think about more worlds beyond the pole <laughs> and more land. You're going to have to think about chronography, chronology, and timelines, and three major chronological time shift you're gonna have to think about phantoms duplications typologies man all this is relative and relevant when you talk press the job tarzan means loving the holy land places and people tarzan to church holy land church tarzan to chapel in jerusalem in jerusalem right so where's jerusalem Well, there sure is some Taurus Octa going on. Right over here in the Americas. <laughs> Gateways to more worlds beyond the poles. How much do we really know? And how much do they really show about Taurus Octa? How much are they giving us? Love to the bro set cool. What a great map you found, brother. What a great map. So before you let them tell you they brought you from Africa, say what about Tarzan? <laughs> oh, it's a bunch of ice now. Oh, okay, okay. What about the little ice age? Oh, okay, okay, all right. And why is there a Virginia here? And a big old Virginia here. And yeah, what's up with this Moroni? Huh? Moroni. I have to look back in the Mormons. <laughs> look out for the new series, Mormons Digging Deep. Because we digging deep. Tarzanta means holy land. Yeah. India. Superior. Uh, Terra Fuego. Why would there be hot Fuego land in Antarctica? That don't make no sense. Unless it's hot land, you know. 
India Superior. What do they call it again? <laughs> Just for kicks, man. Sometimes you gotta laugh out loud, you know. Oh, they call this Africa. They call this Africa. Oh, okay, got it. The Moors call America Africa. Got it. Got it, boss. That's it. That's all I want to know. <laughs> Just had to get that kick right quick. Ania. Covera. Kiever. Eber. Land of the Eberu. Is Holy Land. Is Jerusalem. Is Harashalayim. And everything else, everything about us got to be mythical, man. Got to be mythical. But we're still talking Ania, Ana, Anian, Hana, Hana, Kana, right? How many Canaan's? <laughs> oh, man. These Canaan's everywhere, right? Ana's everywhere. So when they keep telling us about this Canaanite flow, think about Anion and Canaan. And, you know, they're getting a lot from this Canaan, Hanan, Anion connection. And this Anion is the straight, literally the straight. Or what they call now Bering Strait, where they were like, oh, the Indians are crossing the Bering Strait. We're talking Asia, boss. And we're talking Asia. And when you cross that strait, you run right into the land of the Preston, which is why he's called the emperor of the three Indias. Sarah Palin sitting over there in Alaska saying she could see Russia. All this is Rus land, right back to the Rus connection. So when you see this Rus talk, they're just talking this Asia that connects to this Asia through the Anion flow. When you get over here, you start finding Anion kingdom, Quavera kingdom. These are kingdoms of the Preston of King David. These are Hebrews. These are Hebrews, man. It's all connected and it's all happening. They just want to take the light out of your eye bones, right? It is true that in the heat of debate, many men made rash statements. Many statements were misconstrued. Many conclusions were jumped at. Many things were looked at from only the uh, from only one viewpoint during the great slavery debate in the House of Delegates when Virginia came so near proving a policy. Of gradual emancipation, gradual freedom. But now they don't want gradual freedom. They want to put you in perpetual slavery. Mr. Barry of Jefferson County, speaking on Friday, January 20th, 1832, said, quote, We have, as far as possible, closed every avenue by which light might enter the slave's minds. If we could extinguish the capacity to see the light, our work would be complete. They would then be on a level with the beast of the field, and we should be safe. Eighteen thirty two. That's uh, right around that Tecumseh flow, right? So, <laughs> when they ran up on these Nagas right here, they were extinguishing their life, but they're also extinguishing the light from all those that they would take into captivity. They can't let them know who they are. They cannot let them know where they're at, and they can't let them know where they're from. Eighteen eleven. 
1812. 20 years later, they're still having a mission statement to extinguish the light from their eyes, man. And you see it all the wars popping off, Negro wars, so-called Indian wars. But we just talking India Superior. So during this great slavery debate, this Jabroni Berry's talking about, look, man, we have as far as possible closed every avenue. What does that mean, man? They've done so much slaughter. They've done so much separating, mutilating, genocide. So much brainwashing, told so many lies. They've been so cruel. They caused so much pain and division, separation. We have as far as possible closed every avenue. That means they gave you, no, they changed times and laws. They gave you new maps, man. Nothing you see, nothing is what it seems by the time someone closes every avenue, my life. Nothing can possibly be what it seems when someone is declaring that they've closed every avenue by which light might enter your mind ball. And they continue and say, if we could extinguish the capacity to see the light. So we've taken the light out, but we just want to make sure we extinguish any possibility that they'll ever know the truth. We need to extinguish their capacity to see. See the light. Which means they have to extinguish the dragon. Because they need to extinguish your capacity to see. The light. Khan. Amaru Khan found here. Khan. Durkestai. To see clearly. They have to extinguish your capacity to ever see clearly. They have already closed every avenue by which light might enter your mind. <laughs> so they've already separated you from your soul, man, from your dragon, man. Now they want to make sure that's permanent. They want to put you in perpetual servitude, Pabu Boo, right? So you can't ever see clearly. You can't ever come get, you know what I'm saying, no payback. Nah, because you don't see. You think you African. When they found you in India Superior. They've taken your life. Yeah, and, you know, as we keep mentioning this Zoroaster, but you, the the Zora <laughs> is the light. Is the dragon. Is the fierce violent person, man or woman, as this male or female, is a dragon in 18, you know, what's this, uh, 1828, right? <laughs> so all this is happening around the same time. The Quran say 1811, 1812, this is 1828. Noah Webster Dictionary, you got the 1832, this Henry Berry popping off in the House of Virginia talking about extinguishing your light. And the light is the dragon, and the dragon is you, male or female, man or woman is a dragon if they are fierce how are you fierce because you see clearly you're violent because you see clearly now you're a savage a naked savage the dragon is the media the preston is the media the Prester is the meteor, the dragon is the meteor, the Prester is the dragon. If we're talking fierce and violent towards the hijack, 
and they got to extinguish your light, my naga. So I've done a lot to extinguish your light. And now they want to extinguish your capacity to ever, ever see clearly. We have come, we have as far as possible closed every avenue, man, by which light might enter these Negro minds, slaves' minds. If we could extinguish the capacity to see the light, our work would be complete. They would then be on the level with the beasts of the field and we should be safe. I'm not certain that we should not do it if we could find out the process. And that on the plea of necessity <laughs> in, con in contradistinction to the radical utterance to the other debaters on both sides usually spoke the great kindness of the masters trying to aid their Negroes, yet recognizing the naughty problem that the Negroes were and would be. <laughs> well, we just a problem? Oh, we <laughs> because we're fierce, because we're violent towards the hijack. Such oratorial, oratorical flights as Mr. Berry indulged in, while not in the strict Court with facts are rolled as sweet morsels under the tongues and are quoted with as much confidence as if they had been wholly written by those who have seen only one side of the great slavery system of Virginia. Yeah, it's true that the methods of this early day may have produced a Nat Turner, <laughs> a Nat Turner too, religious, or may have produced some not religious at all. Yeah, yeah. When they when they speak Nat Turner religious, they talking about them dragons. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> when you speak on that Nat, you're talking about them dragons, man. <laughs> he he was seeing clearly. He said, nah, nah, nah. This ain't normal. This ain't natural. I ain't doing it one more day. <laughs> he is a dragon. He is fierce and violent. To the mother sucking hijack. He is a dragon, right? He ain't violent to his people. He's violent to anyone who wants to put his people in captivity. That's a normal response for a dragon. Raja Haraja, Dadara, Chola, the Pandya. India Superior. Yeah, all this coincides, all this connects when you talk this Tamil dynasty, this India Superior flow, this Mongol China kind of flow, of course, Native American. Of course, biblical, Russian, Russian. It all converges right here at home. The Chola dynasty was a Tamil Thalaskratic empire with of southern India. And you see, that just means that sometimes also maritime. So uh, they, they traveled on the seas. Right? <laughs> One of the longest ruling dynasties in world history, the earliest datable references to the Chola are from inscriptions dated to the 3rd century BCE during the reign of Ashoka of the Maurya Empire. Man. So you got this fancy word, Thala, Thal, Asocratic, which just means that you're in maritime. <laughs> You're seaborne, right? Like Phoenicians. You know these are Nagas. And then you got the Moria Empire. <laughs> Any questions? Now, we're just talking Muans, Muans, <laughs> as one of the three 
crowned kings of Tam al Khan, along with the Kara and Pandya. So we see in Prester John, Jadaran, the Pandya, it's connected directly with the Kara flow. The Pandian flow, the Tamil dynasty flow, Chola, Pandya. Who was Prester John? Emperor of Soli, <laughs> father of David, the sixth, right? So Ping Pao, you connect the Cholas with the Davids very, very simply. <laughs> the Chola, Davids, and then, you know, it connects with this Georgia flow. We talked Babylon last time. We're going to talk more Georgia. Queen Tamar, you know what I'm saying? David Sauceless. So keep all this in mind, man. We're talking Axelarks. When we talk Cholas and Panion, so... How does biblical history now connect with this ancient Tamil dynasty, India history, unless you understood you're in India superior? Or else they can't converge, my nigga. But they do, you know, so well, so simply, when we talk Chola and when we talk Pandy. You know we're talking present job. Oh, wow. Now, this is because we, you know, just because we start reading into Chola, you know, and these sites and wiki and all that, they're not going to give us the, all the drop either, right? So, they're not going to tell us that they're talking about so called Negroes, <laughs> the Negro problem. The same Virginia, you know, delegate trying to take the light out of our eyes. The same issue, the same issue, the same people. Let's go. Land of the Presta Jar. Let's, let's go. Pandy and Chola, right? So we also talking Kara, and they still practicing Karaism and Judaism today. Man, I got, I got receipts. Right, <laughs> but how would you know that this car K A R A is the same as they're saying here? Okay, they got that bow and arrow flow, man. All right, <laughs> same cars, right? C's and K's, all that, right? Okay, okay. Kara Dynasty, ancient Tamil Dynasty, who are credited as the creators of land of Kaurala. What? Kaurala. And all this is also going to connect with this Cartley flow when you dig on the House of Georgia. Bragantoni, all the Rus, Russian flow, so called European flow. It's the same as this Kara connection. So this whole Carly, Cara, Cartley, all this stuff connects to the same Cara dynasty of the Tamil flow, connects to the same Caraism that the Jews are popping off. But this car is very special, just like the Zoroaster flow. Because they initially are just trying to be hijacked free, running from Muhammad in him, right? Whether you spell it with a K or a Q, same thing, or a CH. They say to read. Okay, all right. We're talking poor or not is because they don't mess with no town. Ooh. They have repudiated oral tradition as the source of divine law, and they in the Hebrew Bible as the sole authentic font of religious doctrine and practice in dismissing the Talmud as man-made law substituted for God-given Torah. Kara 
is set itself in direct opposition to the rabbinic Judaism. <laughs> this is the op of what you call Judaism today. These are their ops. That's why you never hear about it. Because <laughs> they're talking with none of that oral stuff, tradition, none of their taboo. They repudiate the oral tradition of the, as the divine law. They say, now nah, you got to rock with the Tanakh. You got to rock with the Hebrew Bible or the Torah. That's who the car is. They are co-keepers by nature, not, a, not the ism. I'm not talking about who they are today, right? If I talk about Zoroastrianism today, coming off the Zora light flow, that's a different, you know, f those today are not the originals. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get to the root of it all. Because we natural by law. Love to the cause, man. So I ain't talking isms and issues. I'm talking Kara. They say Kara means black. And Turkey Kara means, means to read. Man, we're just talking about that Ka. That Ka is the dragon. We're talking light. Back to the Zora. The car. It's the car. Creators of land of Corala. Like North Carolina, South Carolina. I'm talking Car Empire. They have unified this land in various regions on the western coast and western Ghats to form the early Car Empire. The Car country was geographically well placed to profit from maritime. Maritime, right? <laughs> Travel, trade. King Solomon's boats, right? Queen Sheba, right? Via the extensive Indian Ocean networks. Let's back it up, man. Because again, we're talking Sheba, which means we're talking spices. So we got to Kara by talking Chola. Chola is one of the three crowned kings of Tal Malakan. Remember, Presa John, king of the three Indians. Here's another perspective of it. The Kara, the Chola, the Pandya. The Kara, the Chola, the Pandya. Jadaran. Raja Raja Chola. The Pandya. <laughs> Emperor of Soli pressed the child, and this is why all these dynasties, all these exilarchs, all these Khans, all these royals are coming out this house. And all of them understand that there's a king, there's a Khan. And that connects back to Presta Child in a beautiful way. Three crowned kings. Tamala Kam is Tamala Khan. Primarily known as Muvandir, the Tamil kings. World of the three. Three glorified by heaven. Three crowned rules. Refers to the triumvirate of Kara, Chola, or Kola. Mm, like Coca Cola. Okay. <laughs> Pandy. Panya, who dominated the politics of the ancient Tamil country, Tamalakam, for their three Nadu countries of Chola, Nadu, Pandya, Nadu, present day Madurai, and Taranu Veli, and Kara Nadu, present day Kerala, and some parts of Tamil Nadu in southern India. And this is when you have to apply India superior and say interception. This is talking about ancient India, not present day India. Just like the Chinese flow. Your ancient history is talking about ancient China, which is not present day China. Same as the Japanese flow. Ancient Japan is Kapangu, Zapangu. Zapan, Zapan is not current day Japan. 
India is not current day India. They signal the time of integration and political identity for the Tamil people. They frequently wage war against one another under a period of instability and between each other. That does that sound familiar? When we talk more and more war, held control over Greater Tamil Kam over sixth century BC to thirteenth century. Does this date sound familiar? So all this wild stuff I'm coming with still keeps converging in the twelve hundreds, man. Genghis Khan wrote upon Preston John in 1202, 1200s, 1100s, 12th century, 11th century. And then what? They find you in the 1400s, man. Christopher Columbus finds you in 1492, sells the ocean blue. Come on, man. There ain't, there ain't a lot of gap in time between the fall of these three crown kings, Tamil kings. There's not a lot of gap in the fall of Judah. Between the time they found us, Genghis Khan's invasion, and Columbus popping off. There's not a lot of time for all you millions of people to come from Africa. <laughs> all this is it's all happening right here in your face. Right here in your face, Bone. Let's keep going, man. I mean, we're just connecting all this. I'm just showing you the connections, all right? Daniel Ben Moshe Al Kun. <laughs> Back to the Karians. We just, you know, they have, they got the Kariism today, but they're getting it from the original Karakatai or the Karian. Karite. So this Daniel, as we spoke on before, seems to be connected with this Kiliab, who is also called Daniel, who is the son, the second son of King David who is the same Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar, you know, held hostage, but raised up in the kingdom and made an XLR, who is the same uh, Nebuchadnezzar, which means Nebo defend your boundaries. Nebo defend my boundaries is Nebuchadnezzar, which could be Genghis Khan. And this could be a key pivotal element in the Prester John versus Genghis Khan battle. Did he have Prester John's son, David, hostage things that make you go hmm is, is Daniel cool <laughs> is he the one that's being raised up cool in captivity under Genghis made Exilarch under Genghis but that wasn't accepted outside in the house of Israel because you can't let no foreigner make an Exilarch for us even though he was protected Daniel was made Exilarch by Nebuchadnezzar, or he was raised up, right? But from the outsiders looking in, they said, nah, man, you can't let George Bush make a prince over black people. <laughs> nah, man, we, we got our own leaders. And so they had their own exilarch on the outside, but Daniel was kind of let the exilarch running things on the inside. And, you know, he still had a pure art, but they just weren't going for it on the outside. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's all we got this car yet scholar and leader of this Aveli Zion or mourners of Zion right leaders in Zion he was born in Dom Khan in the province of Kumis <laughs> northern Persia where's that we're talking Persia we're talking Pars remember last time when they kept saying Persia is coming from Pars P-A-R-S we say doesn't that sound a lot like where they place Mexico. Does North America even exist, boss? I'm just talking Asia. And when we talk Persia, are we just talking Paris? Paris, as they say, it comes from P A R S. Pars is Persia. Then what's Paris? Mexico. Bang. Got a <laughs> body bag. So look, don't don't let them Persia you. When they say Persia, at least for this investigation, for the time being, think Mexico. Let's see if we can figure this out.
Let's go. So he's in Persia or Mexico. Little is known of Daniel's life. How they know where he at. He was evidently the first eminent Karian author to settle in Jerusalem where he died. Independent in theological outlook, Daniel belittled the founder of Karianism, Anand Ben David, and dissented from certain of his halakhic principles or principles, right? So they had their beef as to what was going on in the Torah or certain laws, you know what I'm saying? And first they rock with each other, then they had some beef. But if Daniel's the son of David, because we're just talking Kelly, surfed away with me, surfed away with a nun. If Kilib is also known as Daniel, second son of David, right? And he's supposed to be one of four Israelites who died without sin. Perfect Nagas. Because rabbinic traditions name him as one of four. Four Israelites who died without sin. The others being David's dad, Jesse, Moses' pops, Amra, and Benjamin, you know, tribe of Benjamin. So he's very important. And he was given the name Kilia because he would resemble the perfection of his father, King David. And that was because there was some dispute whether Abigail was pregnant through David or her first husband, who... I guess he passed or, you know, so she, she was a widow. So David remarried her, you know, or married her. And they didn't know if she was pregnant from from the first husband or, da or David. So Hawa made Daniel the perfection of King David, the perfection of his father. And his name was Kiliot, although his name was also Daniel. It was David's son with his wife Abigail, widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, and mentioned in 1 Chronicles 3.1, 2 Samuel 3.3, 3. unlike the other David's three elder sons, Amnon, Absalom, and Adonijah, who were important characters in 2 Samuel, Kiliab is only named in the list of David's sons. So here we go hiding things again. And no further mention is made of him. But he's the perfection of his father. He's a perfect man. <laughs> this is why uh, Nebuchadnezzar or Genghis Khan raised him up as an exilarch because he deserved it. I mean, he's a perfect knight, right? He's a cold keep. And that will make him the brother of Anon, since we're talking about Anon ben David or Ania. Or, <laughs> you know, yeah, the. A non kingdom, man. So back to the Hannah flow or Hanan flow. So this seemed kind of similar when we look at it from this angle of Raja Hiraja Chola Jadaran, Emperor of Soli, Prestija. Because he too, you know, he has a son. Uh, David Sauslin. He also has the son, Salima. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then he has the son, Hana, H A N A N, which could also be the same Anna we talk about. Follow me now. <laughs> We're still talking Hana, right? Or Kanan or Canaan. <laughs> Ka, Ka. Because the Han is the Ka, Ka. So this Hanan be the same Anan or Ania. Daniel even belittled the founder of Karism or the Kar Katai, Anna, Anna, dissented from certain of his halakhic principles, justifying himself by the maxim, those who come later will find the truth. Daniel also consistently maintained his principle in regard to himself. According to the Karian scholar Kasani, he would exchange, or excuse me, accept any conclusion arrived at by reasoning and would acknowledge changes whenever they occurred in regard to opinions he had expressed in his writings in matters of law, Daniel was more rigorous than his fellow Karyans. 
So he was more rigorous. All right. So on the other hand, he is said to have attempted males aged under 20 or excuse me, exempted males under age under 20 from the duty to observe all biblical ordinances and admitted the testimony of Muslims and matter connected with determination of the Jewish calendar. So they're, you know, tidbits. They're going back and forth on. Daniel occupied himself to a considerable extent in biblical exegesis while refraining from exhortation. He supplies brief comments intended to explain the simple meaning of the biblical text in the rationalistic manner he interprets, for instance, the concept of angels as natural forces. Uh-oh. We ain't talking about men with wings no more. <laughs> We're talking about the elements now. It's fire and water. Come <laughs> sent as divine emissaries and consequently negates the existence of angels because he didn't want to go Christian on them, man. He didn't want to start painting pictures of men with wings and babies with wings. He, we're talking dragons, man. We're talking the elements, which is the dragon, the fire, the water, the ether, the earth. That's just, you know, connecting <laughs> more connection between Hilliard, Daniel, and they call him Daniel Ben Moshe, right? I don't want to miss that. <laughs> so some would, you know, say Daniel, son of David. This one's calling him Daniel, son of Moses. Uh, back to the advanced uh, wave surfer question, man. Is the David and Moses flow interconnected deeper than we have been told? We're talking priest kings, right? Moses, king of Kush for 40 years. He's a king and a priest. David, we know he's a king, but, you know, the, the prester in him has been hidden. Daniel ben Moshe Akum, coming to rise in Hebrew. And then they had mentioned the Kirkasani flow, but that also connects to this Jacob al Kirkasani. would call a carrot carrot scholar but who is he man is he just a scholar man who is jacob kirk man abu yosef yakub son of isaac ishak son of sam awa awa hawa al kirk and they put him first half 10th century 900s and we'll get that chronology again saying everything seems like it's dated at the furthest back in the 900s. And after that, you know what I'm saying? Or before that, you have all these chapters and duplications. And then all the realistic history seems to be coming after the 9th century, according to Anatomy from Mangle. Now, pay attention to this Kirk Asani name as we continue to make some connections right in your face, ball. This is amazing. <laughs> Shalawas, go. So his surname has been variously derived from Kirkasia, the ancient Kirkasia in the Midrash. Kirkasayan or Zion. So his surname is derived from Kirkasia, Kirkasian. Upper Mesopotamia and Kirkusan or Kirkusayan or Kirkusan. What's it got to do with the Sambanya? <laughs> Small town of Baghdad, the sequence of his names implies that he was called Jacob. Who was Kirkusini, man? <laughs> Look. This da this Daniel Alcoon, they said little was known to him. The Nomin David, little known to him. Jacob Kirkusini, little known to him. Preston John, I mean, you know, so this is why we gotta investigate, since there's so little known of our ancestors, but they want to tell us we from Africa, we now Christians. When all this flow connects back to the house of David. When all this flow connects back to the kingdom. Hashirah. The 
12 tribes. And now we're just talking Jacob again. The sequence of his names, check this out, <laughs> implies that he was called Jacob. Uh, his father is called Isaac. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? And his son is Joseph. Hijack city. I mean, straight hijack. Straight up hijack. <laughs> you know what I mean? Straight up hijack. The sequence of his names implies that he was called Jacob. His father is Isaac. His son is Joseph. Reproducing. The sequence of the biblical patriarchs, later Chariot authors, thought erroneously that his forename was Joseph. It confused him with the Chariot scholar Joseph, son of Abraham, Ha Roish, Roe, Yosef Al Basir, who lived a century later. Well, we know they're switching our timelines up quite often. I'm just connecting this, man. So there's a Kirk Cassini flow, you know, and they said that this Daniel L. Kuhn Daniel also consistently maintained his principle in regard to himself, right? According to the Karyat scholar Kirk Cassini, he would accept any conclusion arrived at by reasoning. So this Kirkasani is mentioning Daniel, you know, in his, uh, you know, his recon, his writing. All right. We're learning Dan, you know, he killed the perfection of his father. He was very rigorous when it came to the code. Anami David wrote the code. Daniel wrote on code. Same code. Sefer Hamas. Whoa. That uh, Moses Mamanides is writing. We got that. Y'all go get that whole uh, three Moses is dry. We did. He was thoroughly acquainted with the contemporary Arabic theology because talking air proper philosophical and scientific literature and had a substantial knowledge of the Mishnah, the Gemara, uh -huh, some Midrash works, the rabbinic. So he, he had all the drop. He also read the New Testament and the Quran. I mean, of course, he had to get the babies out the bathwater. Perhaps some of the Christian patristic literature, you know, they'll say the same thing about us today. Oh, yeah, well, they were, you know, had some knowledge of this and that and this and that. But what conclusion was he coming to? Was he going away from the creator? Or was he confirming the code of Hawa? <clears throat> of his non karyat associates, he mentions the rabbinic scholar Jacob, son of Ephraim, <laughs> and the Christian bishop, so-called, or rather deacon Yas, who Sekha, with both of whom he was on terms of personal friendship. Unlike some Karyat fanatics, he avoided personal vituperation in his anti rabbinic rabbinite polemics. al Kirkasani led the logic of his thought and the range of his the range of his learning speak for themselves, so that he was by far the most formidable champion of Karyism of his age. Champion of the Kar. <laughs> the Kar. Since he was a firm believer in the use of reason and intelligence and theology and jurisprudence, his views in this field are characterized by common sense. I use some common sense. A lot of people don't use common sense because common sense ain't common. And moderation. Some people take things too far. He was, he had common sense. He had intelligence. He had reason. Although he did not hesitate to ally himself with the partisans of such rigorous laws as the Cantonary Recouv theory of forbidden marriages. All right. It gets deeper. Let's go.
very, very interesting. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, just put in Daniel Kumixi and, you know, different things will pop up, man. This is called a new edition of the works of Daniel Kumixi by Barry Dub, D-O-V, Wallfish from the Ben Gurion University. All right, fair use, copyright 107. We're going to... You know, I literally belly flop to the 14 minute mark, but you could recon the whole thing and, you know, see, uh, let's get a couple minutes as he talks about Daniel Kumisi, see how it com compares, you know, contrast to our investigation. And we're going to pick it right up out of this going into Anand Ben David, some more Kumisi flow, man. And, uh, <laughs> to that queen tomorrow house of Georgia, let's go. It was subsequently prepared for publication by Ephraim Urbach and David C. Burnett and published in 1957 uh, in the uh, series uh, published by Mikit Sengu Mark Cohen's edition is fairly minimalist. <coughs> the text notes biblical verses cited, gives cross references within the commentary, cites deviations from the Masoretic text makes necessary emendations and explains the Arabic losses. However, what the edition lacks is a proper introduction to place to meet in this commentary in their proper historical socio-religious context. Or even to put the commentary in the context of the rest of the Mises' work. Sviyan Khori in his review of Marcon's edition laments the lack of, of an introduction and more, more detail for notes, notes and suggests that this would diminish the use made of the commentary by scholars in other fields who would not appreciate its significance. He even questioned the wisdom of publishing it in such a minimalist fashion, suggesting that it would delay the publication of a full edition with proper apparatus. Indeed, it has survived for 50 years and been used but probably not, not as, as much as, as it could have been. When's the need for a new edition? The other fragments of Khamisi's works have been edited by scholars over the span of much of the 20th century, beginning with Schechter's edition of Leviticus Fragments in 1903 and then the Benjamin's edition and translation of Daniel Fragments in 1981 and uh, Published with translation in 1990. Bringing together of all of the work in one volume of all the text edited uniformly will facilitate further research on this seminal figure and help contextualize the minor prophet's commentary as well. Well, 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 from the Minor Prophets Commentary into Durham, and Ben Shemai and Nimoy published translations of Daniel Fragments. Other than that, translations of other short sections have appeared in articles and books by Natalia Vigar, Yuri Pauliak, and others. The sermon was published in English by Leon Nimoy in an article of Proceedings of the American Academy for Jewish Research. Having the entire course available in English will make it available to a much broader range of scholars interested in medieval exegesis, charism, and its links with the Dead Sea Scrolls. As of today, I drafted several sections of the translation of the Minor Prophets commentary, but much still needs to be done. The, the task of translation will probably be the most difficult of all, since many of Khamisi's comments are obscure and extreme and almost defy comprehension. Furthermore, the gaps Defy comprehension. They don't understand. They don't comprehend the works of Khamisi. They don't comprehend the work of Kirk Asani. They don't comprehend the work of Anand Ben David. Shashir, Anya, Anya. All right, so, I mean, look, we're just talking about the Kariot movement. And when I'm talking Kar, just remember, they're still talking Kar.
the Kara dynasty. They're still talking Kara. The Karians. They say Karism. They say Cholas. They say Penians. We just still talking Kara. Like the Kara Katan or Pethe. Or Katan, Jaktan, Eberflow, Kavera, Enya. Let's go. And I'm in David, widely considered to be a major founder in Kari movement in Judaism or Judah. Or Judah. His followers were called Ananites. And like most modern Karyats, like modern Karyats, did not believe in rabbinic Jewish oral tradition laws. None of that. No hijack to be authoritative. From the second century to second third of the seventh century and until middle of the eighth, as a result of the tremendous intellectual commotion produced throughout the Western Asia by the swift early Muslim conquest of the Arabs. Why? Because they're conquesting Arab proper, switching it up with the Arab pretender. Those are two different things. This Muslim conquest, especially when you talk about Kish, you know, King Saul's pops, King Saul had a dad named Kish. Kish had his name changed to Arab al-Rashid by Muhammad himself and was told by Muhammad to spread Islam amongst these Hebrews, amongst these Judah, right? So he's like the first Muslim missionary, King Saul's dad, you know what I mean? <laughs> Hi. This legendary form of the tradition that Catan was the progenitor of the southern Arabs or Arab proper. While the Ishmaelite Arabs or non Arab stock. So this Muslim conquest was the non Arab stock conquesting the actual Arab stock or Arab proper or genuine Arabs which is why they had to intermarry with our queens to be genuine to be proper we just talking Eber man we just talking Eber rule so this Muslim conquest was all about replacing the proper with the pretender early Muslim conquest of the Arabs <laughs> and the collision of Islam with the older religions and cultures of the world there arose a large number of religious sects especially in Persia Pars <laughs> what Persia Pars Persia Pars Paris Mexico Antonius or Arantius finds Matt 1531 puts Pars, Parius, Persia, where Mexico is. Mexico is Persia. Yeah. Western Asia. <laughs> Where's Asia balls? Western Asia. Where's where's Asia? Where's Pars? Where's Pars? <laughs> Just put the S right before the I. Just switch the S right before the I, and you got Parsia, Persia. Uh oh. Especially Persia, Babylonian, Babylon. Okay. Uh, they put Iraq in parentheses because that's conjecture there. That, that's not a fact. Syria. Judaism did not escape the general for or fomentation. Fomentation. The remnants of Second Temple sects picked up 
new life and flickered once more before their final extinction and new sex also arose. Anon, which means cloud. Oh. Mm. Lofty, huh? Cloud, lofty. Wow. Was never a very common name amongst the Jews, but it is attested in the Bible. The original Anan was one of the Israelites who sealed the covenant. Which is why you see the Anion on the maps. <laughs> he sealed the covenant after the return from Babylon. Nehemiah 10, 26. Whoa. Whoa, we never really connected Nehemiah 10 with Ania. Whoa. And yet, for all this, we make a sure covenant and subscribe it. And our princes, our Levites, our priests set their seal upon it. Now, those that set their seal were... Nehemiah, the Ter Tata, Tershata, son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah. And it goes all down, and you see Ahia, Ahaya, Hana, Ana. So Anan was there present with Hana. <laughs> so are those the same names or a different Hanan and Ana? <laughs> Okay. We getting some drop today. So Anon sealed the covenant. After the return from Babylon. And we're talking about the Exilarchs during this Babylonian, Babylonian captivity, such as Hana. We've been talking about the whole time. We just didn't know it was right there in our face bone in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 26. And Hanan is the Jewish king of Tehama, which is why he would be there to seal the covenant. And he is also the son of Prester John, Chola, Jadara, Jadara. <laughs> All right, Prester John. And brother of Exilarch David, the sixth Sauceland, who we about to talk about a little bit further. And David is the Sousland or Sauceland, which also means sword or fiery, like a dragon. Of Babylon <laughs> and Georgia, which we about to talk about. Man, ain't nobody ever broke it down like this, man. This is all wah wah in real time. The reason why this name was bestowed on the seventh century man are not known, but somehow his name means cloud. Let's keep going. You know, so of course you got the Kumisi flow. This time spelled with a K. One of the most prominent scholars of Koreaism, Korea, Judaism, they say. It is shown by his two surnames, the latter of which is found only in Kirkasani. So there's a special like connection with the information of the recon with this Jacob Kirkasani and this Daniel Kamisi. They seem to really be connected with this car car flow. His attitude to Anam and David, his violent opposition to the Ananites, first the Karyas. Uh It says they first he esteemed Anon highly, calling him the chief of the scholars, and then something went down. <laughs> And he started calling him chief of the fools. So 
This might be a brotherly quarrel if they are both sons of David, Daniel, Kiliab, son of David, Anand, Ben David, son of David. This could be a brother quarrel going on. But we're still talking Zion. We're still talking Jerusalem. Daniel Coolies, right? Right. Where the coon generally means to rise up or stand like a Nat Turner. I mean, just like Nat Turner, just like any revolutionary would be on coon. Today you say, come, right? Come, okay, come here, man. Hey, get up, man, come. Come, man. man back then it's coon. Come. Coon, same thing. Daniel, cool me, see. Eliakim, El Hawakul. Same word. Let's go. Now, here they are with their Judaisms, their Kara isms. And we're dodging the issues and the isms, man. I mean, we get enough, we see enough that with their car. Even in their ism today, they are still against the oral traditions of their hijacked Judaism and the hijacked Talmud. They're the number one op. <laughs> They're in opposition to this hijack today. Even in the isms, man. Even in the isms. They pushed our timelines back. They've changed times and laws, man. Sometimes you got to see it to believe it. By the time we're talking, David, 700s, you can put a thousand years back and you're back to the Dukum safe flow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and all that. You know, this is all happening. You know, you can, you know, put back 300 years. You could put back 1,800 years in some cases and you still... Okay. You're still talking about how they intentionally, not unintentionally, but intentionally, Skylar and Potatoes and whoever else, intentionally added time. So if they found you in the 1200s, it's like you. Oh no, that was 1800 years ago. They created a whole new world of history. Take этих летописей жили не только в разных странах, но даже в разное время. Они говорили и писали на раз. But the authors of these chroniclers were living not only in different countries, but even at different times. They spoke and wrote different languages, different calendars. All right, this is Anatole, totally for medical history, fiction, or science. Fair use in your caboose, research purposes only. Right. Entertainment purposes, educational purpose, all that. We're talking about the methods of chronology. На разных языках использовали разные лета исчисления. Не удивительно, что рассказывая об одном и том же королеве они давали им совершенно. They can talk Anand here, they can talk David there, they can talk Kiliab there, they can talk Kirkusani there. All they gotta do. It's changed the name, but still be talking about the same king. Change the city, but still be talking about the same king. Change the battle. Like now you got the battle of the tip of canoe <laughs> in America, but they're still talking about the same king from what they're talking about. Battle of such and such in the Middle East, such and such in in, in Russia, such and such in, you know, uh, Scotland. Like they're changing the names. They're changing the cities. They're changing the name of the battle, but they're still talking about the same car. And this is factual. Therefore, when Chronicle the 1600s, right, that's King Charles Kento era, right? Read these records. They decided that they were talking about four different eras. They decided that they were talking about И вместо того, чтобы поместить эти летописи на оси времени одну на другой, они расположили их последовательно, то есть друг за другом. 
одну летопись они оставили в 15 Вторую отодвинули. назад на 300 лет, третью назад на 1000 лет, а четвертую на 1800 лет. So by the time they drop this off, this is the Bible today. King David in the BCs, yada, yada, yada. You accept it because you don't understand that the timeline is so fickle that they can change history, that they can change times and laws. But the book of Maccabees talks about how they're going to switch their images, right? And they're going to change times and laws. The Greeks, that is. So they dropped you off. <laughs> И времени одну над другой они расположили их последовательно, то есть друг за другом. Одну летопись они оставили в 15 веке, вторую отодвинули назад на 300 лет, третью назад на 1000 лет, а четвертую на 1800 лет. Соединили их вместе и получилась очень длинная хронология. Only with the help of mathematical statistics can we have a truly objective analysis of old texts. Without them, unfortunately, it is impossible to construct a chronology. So this recount of Anatoly Fomenko had to use the mathematical statistics, look at the phantoms of duplications, and put things back together again, man. Put Humpty Dumpty back together. You are the drag. James the sixth of Scotland, same history. James, King James, Charles, same more and more war, same history. And it's fun, I mean, you know, getting the babies out of this, of course, you know, this author likes to talk his thoughts and Osiris and all that stuff a lot, but all these are also phantasm and duplication. They're always worth looking into. Now, I talked about some of this uh, Holy Grail. Melchizedek. With the Melchizedek, we're talking both king and priest. His name means king of justice. King of Salam, Salim, Shalom, peace. Some have also identified him with another king in Jerusalem. Oh yeah, Alexander the Great, who was believed to have horns literally grown from his head like Saturn, okay. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, priest king. A mysterious priest king. <laughs> priest means Prester. King is John or Juan, Prester John. So we know throughout history you're going to find many under this title you know which ones are the righteous presters you know who are the real priests is what we are determining thoth will be considered a prester john you know he'll be considered a priest king in his own right charles v will be considered a prester john king um yeah you know, king george or georgie or uh genghis khan will consider himself a prester john so we dodge Some people like to do do a little recon and say, oh, well, see, Prester John must be a hijack, Edomite, yada. Well, maybe someone to eat him would consider themselves a priest king. But who has the con? Who has the actual blessing, the actual Baruch from the creator directly? Who got that water? Who got that fountain of youth? Who's the con? 
So there's a mysterious priest king mentioned repeatedly in the Old Testament and imbued with an explicable importance. He was called the Prince of Salaam, as in Jerusalem, and is said to have shared bread and wine with Abraham on Mount Moriah. Great document called Dragon Society. Man, go pull it up. He was called the Prince of Salaam, as in Jerusalem, right? Broke bread with Abraham. Some believe that the cup which they used is the artifact that later became known as the Holy Grail. So, interesting, right? That's going back to Genesis 14. Verse 17, after his return from defeating Cador Ke Lamor and the kings who were with him, the king of Saddam went out to meet him in the valley of Shave, valley of the king, and Melchizedek. You remember Melchi? Talking king, Melchi. Zedek, you're talking priest, the king of peace brought out bread and wine he was the priest of the most high he's the priest of Hawa so to be a priest king you gotta be a rab right a rab a rabbi you gotta be a priest of the creator which is how you get Arab proper and Arab pretenders you got those that are pretending to be priest of Hawa and those that are Melchizedek press the job blessed be Abram by Hawa most high maker of heaven and earth and Baruch be Hawa most high who delivered your enemies into your hand and he gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Saddam said to Abram, Give me the people, but the possessions take for yourself. And Abram said to the king of Saddam, I have raised my hand to Hawah, Hawah, most high maker of heaven and earth, that neither a thread nor a throng, a thong of, of the sand, sandal, would I take from all that belongs to you, that you might not say, I made Abraham rich. So they saying that when he's breaking bread, <laughs> he got the Holy Grail with him. And some would say that he is the Holy Grail, Melchizedek. Let's go. And after that, Abraham's popping off, doing the circumcision. He got the priest flow. He got the priest con flow because he met Melchizedek. We're just talking Holy Grail. Some have also identified him with another king of Jerusalem, Adinazek, and with Shem. All right, we talked Shem last time, the Ark Fakshad flow, okay? The Canaan flow, Anan flow. Noah's son. Nobody knows what his ancestry is and who his descendants might be or why. Thousands of years later, J.C. was referred to in the scriptures, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Because this J.C. got to hijack everybody. He got to hijack David. He got to hijack Prester, Priest King. He got to hijack Elijah. He got to hijack uh, Joshua. <laughs> he got to hijack uh, Ezekiel who literally bore the sins of Israel for 430 days, laying in dung, laying in, in shit, man. You know what I mean? On one side, for 380 days, 390, something crazy. You know what I'm saying? And then you have to flip to the other side for the house of Israel, flip to the other side for the house of Judah, to bear the sins of Israel, laying in cow dung, cow, cow shit, for over 400 days straight. But his cruci that that ain't no crucifixion, that, that ain't no torture, that ain't no suffering. <laughs> he had to bear the sins for Israel for over 430 days. Let's go. 
Yeah, JC wants to tie himself into the order of the priest king. Melchizedek significance. Renu Rene Gunan writes Melchizedek, or more precisely, Melchizedek, is none other than the title used by Judeo Judah tradition to denote the function of the Lord of the world. And we got time and time again, Preston John is the King of Kings. Melchizedek is thus both king and priest. His name means king of justice, and he is also king of Salaam, that is, of peace. So again, we find justice and peace, the fundamental attributes pertaining to the Lord of the world. All the way back to Adam, right? In some Syriatic texts, mention is made of a stone that is found, that is the foundation or center of the world. Hidden in the primordial depths near Hawa's temple, it is put in relation with the body of the primordial man, Adam, and interestingly enough, with an inaccessible mountain place, the access to which must not be revealed to other people. Here, Melchizedek, quote, in divine and eternal service. David's called Hawa's servant, right? Forever. Watches over Adam's body in Melchizedek. We find again the representation of the supreme function of the universal ruler, which is simultaneously regal and priestly. Here, this representation is associated with some kind of guardian of Adam's body, who originally possesses the grail and who, after losing it, no longer lives. This is found together with the motifs of the mysterious stone and an inaccessible seat, end quote. Clearly, the foundation stone of the world is the same as the black or hidden sun in the center of the earth or the grail stone, which is said to be hidden in that location. The grail romances provide us with much insight into the king of the world concept. So they're kind of making a reference to this stone. Even this Kaaba stone situation where you have this uh, cube, right? This cube. And the cube is not an evil thing. It's just a platonic solid. It, it's representing what? Uh, Earth. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, thought of them have to hijack these shapes. They got to, they got to hijack the numbers. There's, there's no number that's evil. They just have to hijack certain numbers to link in. So like 440 hertz, they'll hijack the number eight just because it represents some type of loop, right? And they'll use that concept of a loop to have us looping, <laughs> looping around over and over again, right? Like perpetual slavery. Uh, the cube represents Earth, so they got to hijack the cube, even though the cube itself is just a platonic solid. It's really, you know what I'm saying, uh, more like a tesseract, you know what I'm saying? The more deeper you go in your dimension, uh, Understand, you know what I'm saying? The same thing as the dodecahedron and the Merkaba and the six pointed star, which is really the Merkaba, the further you go into the dimension flow, right? So, we just talked about platonic solids, which is, you know, where they're probably getting this stone concept from. We're just getting to the root of it all. The Grail romances provide us with much insight into the king of the world concept. He is represented in the story by one of the supporting characters, Prester. John, a king who is mentioned in passing as ruling over a spiritual dominion, domain in the faraway east, and who quite fittingly is said to come from David descent. I don't have to go far to connect Preston John with King David. Everyone is connected, Preston John, with Davidic descent, man. King David. Which makes you look at the biblical Hebrew story with a dragonfly perspective. Because now you're talking Melchizedek, right? <laughs> Abraham got to get right with Melchizedek, right? They breaking bread, huh? The king of peace. And we got this in... Um, 
uh, the medieval history of the Israelites as well, right? That Traticus Pomeris referred to him as the king of kings, Rex Regnum. He combined spiritual authority with regal power, yet essentially Prester John is only a title and name, which designates not a given individual, but rather a function. And I say, Drop Nation, you are carrying this function today as a collective Mashiach, not as one man or woman, as a collective consciousness, Khan. You are the function. Thus, in Wolfram Van Etchenbach and the tutorial, we find Prester John as a title, the Grail. <laughs> the Grail is the Presta, is the Melchizedek. As we will see, indicates from time to time, the person who must become Preston John. So, Nagas all the time say that we are the true gold, right? That we're worth more than gold. Melanin's worth four hundred dollars per gram. Like it's way, it's way more expensive than gold. Your melanin, man, right? So, you're the real gold rush. And in the same way, you are the real function, and you are the real holy grail. It indicates from time to time the person who must become Prester John, the function. Moreover, in the legend, Prester John designates one who keeps in check. We just read this, the people of Gog and Magog, who exercises a visible and invisible dominion. <laughs> what does it mean? You see clearly, figuratively, dominion over both natural and invisible beings and who defends the access of his kingdom with lions and giants in this kingdom is also found the fountain of youth. I ain't got to go far to connect Preston John with the fountain of youth. Everyone's doing it. I ain't got to connect Preston John with King David. Everyone's doing it. We're talking about dominion over natural and invisible being. Fountain of youth. Quote, the dignity of a sacred king is often accompanied by biblical reminiscences. By presenting Preston John as the son or nephew of King David, and sometimes as King David himself, say it with me, body bad, body bad for the illusion. Preston John, the king, Preston John descends from the son of King David. Or sometimes as King David himself. Now we're talking about the grail stone. <laughs> the holy grail, which is the function, which is you. Preston John is King David. Come, let's go. And notice, let's not skip this over, <laughs> David, since we're talking India, India superior, David is also called the king of the Hindus. And again, a character as big as Preston John or King David should be mentioned in all history of all continents, just like the flood story. And when you recon it, it is mentioned. You got a David and the Hindus. A biblical David, you got the Mongolian uh, David, you know, Genghis Khan's calling himself David, taking out King David, Raja Haraja, Cho, David everywhere, Dawu everywhere, David, king of the Hindus, who was called by the people, Preston John. So even David, king of the Hindus, is called priest king, Preston John. Melchizedek. We're just talking David. King David himself. Story we can get into next time, man. But, you know, David and Oduth, O U D H, Oduth, Old, the Bible story, the Bible story in Sanskrit. And the just king at the Afghan court, right? 
and we got how King David has his court and Jeremiah, uh, Afghan, um, Afghan Jeremiah's son, son of King Saul, is still welcome at the court of King David. Wow. 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 All right, one thousand dollar book, right? Now medieval empire the Israelites, Robert Grisham talking the same thing. The symbol, right? Let's return to the holy blood, holy grail. The symbol of the grail is a symbol of authority. Traditions were inherited. It is part and parcel of the legendary prester. John is the grail. The legend of whom was spread widely in the Middle Ages. John was the master of a huge empire. He was omnipotent, all powerful. Kings and czars were for him only subjects. And then back to the same thing we just read. He's the king of kings, Rex Regnum. Combines in himself spiritual, secular authority. He can say about himself, Presta John, by Hawaii's grace, Lord of all lords, who are only beneath heaven. Only beneath heaven. Only beneath heaven. Presta title is higher than all this king talk. From the rising of the sun to paradise on earth, controls the seen and unseen, visible and invisible, holds back the tribes of God and make God. We're just talking Afghan. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking Persia and India, and there's a lot of uh similarities right i wonder why now we got this khan father great father batu khan vatican typology happening today reflection duplication phantom but the batican is the house of the khan then it became you know batu khan you know back to the Genghis khan And what's going on in the Quran? <laughs> we got the Arab Al Rashid. And like I said, Kish is who popped it all. Kish, who is the father of Saul. Does the adherents of this version maintain that King Saul had a son, Jeremiah, who had a son named Afghanistan? Like Afghanistan. Khan. Afghanistan is a Benjamite, man. Jeremiah died approximately at the same time as his father, Saul. Afghanistan secured a high position in the rule of King David and, and remained at the court. So Afghanistan, son of Jeremiah, son of King Saul, remained at the royal court of King David during the rule of Solomon. So even after David, he still remained in the royal house of David. Now you got the Kish, Saul's dad, being turned into a rap al Rashid, giving instructions to spread Islam to the people. Now you got a Muslim missionary going on in the house of Judah through the Benjamin line. But originally, these Rashids were Arab propers. <laughs> This is a tribe of Benjamin, and Benjamin is a sinless man, according to the Kiliab flow, right? One of four Israelites who died without sin, including Benjamin, Amram, Jesse, who's David's dad. When we talk David, we're talking David. And Afghanistan secured a high position in the rule of King David. And he remained in the royal court. Receipts, my naughty. So now you got this document, <laughs> you know, separate, substantiating document talking about King David. 
a Bible story in Sanskrit and the just king at an Afghan court. <laughs> and we understand that Afghan secured a high position, <laughs> right? In the royal court of King David. I'm talking Afghan. Because Jeremiah had a son, Afghan. Let's go to page eight, man. Let's go. We out of here. Wow. I'm just going to get a few few lines, but on my belly fly. We got the greatest distance of all time going to the Queen Tomorrow Flow. So let's go. You will recall that Colonel Bowden and the evangelists had hoped to translate the Bible into Sanskrit and in other Indian languages as a means of facilitating conversation to Christianity. Hijack. What was ignored in the biblical translation plan was the fact that there had been Christians and Jews in South Asia since the early centuries of the common era. Stories from the Bible and their related teaching had already been propagated in India by Jews, Christians, and Muslims for many centuries. Some of these stories were even told in Sanskrit. Let me choose one example, a rather less well-known one, the stories of David and Solomon, the kings of Israel, but also the Muslim prophets. We're talking air proper, boss. As their stories were told in Sanskrit some 500 years ago. So this Sulama Karita Kritra text at hand, Life of Suleiman, right? It was edited and published by the indefatigable South Indian scholar V. Raghavan in 1973, consisting of 563 verses, four chapters. Three chapters were concerned with events in the life of David, while the fourth is about Solomon. The opening of the text describes the circumstances under which it was composed. The life of Solomon was commissioned by a prince called Lad Khan, Khan, the son of an Adman Khan. Lad Khan and Ahmad Khan were members of the Lodi ruling family, L-O-D-I, originally Afghanis or sons of Jeremiah. We're talking Benjamin, but they ain't going to tell us, right? The Lodis control much of North India in the 15th and 16th, early 16th centuries. We know from various contemporary sources that Ahmad Khan was the administrator of the region Oduth, or Aud, O-U-D-H, also called Avad, or Awad, or Hawa, <laughs> or the Sanskrit Ayada, Ayadiya, Ayadawa. <laughs> Around the 15, year 1500, the common era, he was probably based in the city of Lucknow. Like I said, we really flopping, so we got King Davadu, right? King Dawudu. The first three chapters of this Solomon Karatra are concerned with the events in King David's life, which led up to the birth of Solomon. In particular, they are concerned with the part of the story in which David seduced Bathsheba. Oh, we're going to talk about that, because that's how the Christian story goes. But did it go like that, or are they bearing false witness on the Queen Bathsheba and David? Did it go a lot different? Was, your, was Uriah some perfect bro, or was he trying to take the kingdom? according to the Georgian story. And David came to the aid of Bathsheba or Queen Tamar. Hmm. We're talking David Sausland now. The wife of Uriah, right? The Hittite. But there's another Uriah in the Georgian history. Of course, this was a low point in David's moral life, which was in which he and the children of Israel were expected to learn a memorial lesson. Most features of the biblical, biblical version of the story are found in the Sanskrit one. It was a time of war, the Sanskrit story goes, and David's general Joab was already at the front, the battlefront. But David tarried in the capital city one day from the roof of his place, saw the beautiful woman bathing on the roof of her house. Overcome with desire, she was Bathsheba. Her husband was away with the army. 
In the Bible, the story that follows is rather brief. David's desire for her, inquired about her, lay with her, she became pregnant. All of this requires only three verses to narrate in the second book of Samuel in the Solomonic Karitra. On the other hand, we hear at some length about the seduction, how David was smitten, pinned away inconsolably for Bathsheba, how one of his wives found out from him the cause of his distress and volunteered to serve as a go-between and persuader, how Bathsheba, when approached, refused indignantly, how other women folk assisted in the seduction, whoa, <laughs> how Bathsheba was given the tour of the royal mansion, and how to overwhelm her, David behaved in a way that some might call admirably bold and manly, but others would call shameless and disgraceful. There was the use of love spells and amulets, of potions and philtres. P-H-I-L-T-R-E-S, okay, I dig on that. Possibly of strong narcotics, come on man, so he drugged her now. See the Sanskrit flow, a lot like the Christian flow, they're trying to paint a different narrative of the Hebrew man, right? None of these are originals, man. All of them have their intentions, man. These translators, Sanskrit or English or Greek. Things went on between David and Bathsheba for some time. When David learned that Bathsheba had become pregnant, that there would be no way to make husband or husband believe that the child was his, he sent a message to Joab at the front specifying that Bathsheba's husband should be placed in the vanguard of the battle, and there he was killed. Is it true? Is that the real story, man? Or do we have to recon the history of Georgia and Queen Tamar to get the backstory of who Uriah is? David remained untroubled by what he had done until a sage came to David and told him a story. So he didn't care, right? He's just some heartless uh, adulterer killer, murder, all these things, but yet the covenant is with David. Does that make sense? Does Psalm 89 make sense if this is true? The story was of a wealthy prince and lowly servant, the latter of whom had found a straggling fawn in the forest, which he adopted and raised as a lovely pet. One day the wealthy prince, although he had more than enough cattle and game of his own, carried the poor man's fawn away to cook and to serve as a main course for a feast that he wished to offer his guests. When the sage pointed out to David that he had done something even more unjust than the prince in the story, David asked the sage how to atone, and he was told that the life of his new son of by Bathsheba was forfeit. And after the death of his son, David nevertheless put on a celebration provoking the dismay of his courtiers who asked him, why he was not grieving. In reply, David delivered a philosophical discourse about the nature of the human soul and its immortality in a style that is reminiscent of Bhagavad Gita, the most well-known Sanskrit text in the modern world. Later, when these upheavals had passed, David and Bathsheba returned to life together. They eventually had another son was born to them. This was Solomon, to whom was given the right of royal succession. So the Sanskrit has a lot of connections with the Christian story, you know, just to put that out there. It's pretty much, you know, small. I mean, got more elaborations, but very similar. Curious features. The story of David in Sanskrit has something puzzling about it. It, can, it includes features that are specific to the biblical version. Bang. It's clear, however, from the setting in which the story is told at the Persian speaking court, of a Muslim ruler that the sources for Kalana's story must have been Persia and Arabic versions. And these versions would have been found in the Kisis al Anbiya, the Arabic digest of the lives of the Muslim prophets, which include lives of David and Solomon, an extensive and productive literature in both Arabic and Persian. The Kisis al Anbiya were circulated widely in the Muslim world and were current in India in the times or days of the Lodis, L-O-D-I-S. David and Solomon are known in the literature by the Quranic form of their names, Dawood and Suleiman. These are the names by which they are known 
in our Sanskrit text as well. Uh, so they're just getting it, you know, right, <laughs> pretty much, you know, from this Arabic flow, which is connecting to this Bible flow. Is it an original story that we have to dig a little deeper? I mean, you know, I'm going to keep this up as we keep the water flowing because they came over here for a reason. Columbus knew it. What did Columbus say again? Why did he come to India? <laughs> We're talking Sanskrit, right? Why did he come to India, superior boss? This is the the book of the beginnings, right? <laughs> this is the beginning of the book or collection of the of October texts, sayings, opinions, prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city. This is preserved in the Biblioteca Columbina in Seville. Again, 1500s. That's King Charles, Charles Kento territory. The black King Charles, right? And these are his words, his writings, Book of Prophecies, El Libro de los Profecias, compiled by Christopher Columbus himself. So this is the beginning of the book or collection of authoritative sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city. He didn't come and get lost in India. He came to India Superior to recover the holy city, the promised land, Jerusalem, Kaleluz, Antioch, and Mount Zion. And the discovery, here we go again, discovery. What are you discovering, man? We already got people here. What are you discovering? You're late to the party. Discovery and the conversion of the islands of the Indies. Sounds like the Papal Bull 1452. Subjugate these Saracens, these Nagas, reduced them to perpetual ser servitude, slavery, and all these Indies, these islands, convert them in the name of who? Ferdinand and Isabella. Our Spanish rulers. So Columbus came over here to recover the holy city or to hijack Jerusalem. And he said it himself. Because he came to India Superior in search of Prester John Khan. Khan Khan. Wow. Let's take a breath for the dismount. Y'all ready? Let's take a breath. This man. Queen Tamar of Georgia. Queen Tamar Damar the Great. Right. Georgia Bragantina. Yeah, she's the Bragantina. Queen of Georgia. Tamar of Georgia. Again, same time era, right? 12th century. I'm trying to tell you. Chronology. I think they found most of the drop around the 1200s, 1300s, man. They pushed so much back. A thousand years, 1800 years to the BC. They pushed so much back. Tamar of Georgia, 
Now, she is the wife of who? Well, first, she's the daughter of who? All right, so you'll, you'll see it written different ways. She's the daughter of David the fourth, right? So she's also a father of a David, someone under the title David. Let's talk about this queen for a second. All right. <laughs> now, this David the fourth that we'll get, you know, she's also called her father is also called king of Georgie <laughs> Georgie the third Bragantone king of Georgia so before we just associate Genghis with the Georgie just know that the Georgia title George title like Georgia in Atlanta <laughs> is all weird is, is already here right so and let's see this Georgia is also the father of Rusa Dan and Tamar. Now Rusa Dan is also a title Lady Rus. So her sister has the Rusa Dan title. But we're talking Tamar, who's the queen of Georgia. <laughs> because George is her father. So by the time we get David Sauslin, XLR, and Babylon and Georgia. You know what I'm saying? These these Georges, like the Davids, it's all simultaneous. It's all come <laughs> it's all together. Brother of Princess Georgia of Georgia. That's Georgie. Her dad is the brother of Princess of Georgia, Rusadan of Georgia, and David the <laughs> Fifth, King of Georgia. Rusadan and Bragatoni. So even her father is coming out this line of David's Davidic Cons. And the Rusadan title is heavy. You're talking Lady Rus, like Russia, like Russia. She's the wife of who? David Sauslin, King Consort of Georgia, because since we're talking Queen Tamar, <laughs> she has the con at this time. He's coming to her aid at this time. David Sauslin, who we got before, is the son of Raja Hiraja Chola Preston John, who was also Jadaron. So it appears she's married to this David Sauslin, who's the son of Raja Hiraja Chola II Jadaron, right? Except they spell Jadaron without the D in front, like Jedi. <laughs> Someone put a DJ in front of it, right? Right, so this King Consort David Saucman of the Islands. Now they're bringing in the Island title, like I said. They're going to bring in the Oset title. All these are Hebrews. All these are tribe of Judah, my naga. This David Sauslin, he's the son of Jadaron, king of the islands. Which lets you know one thing. That Jadaron, king of the islands, <laughs> is David the first that we got also in genealogy, found the same way. This Jadaron is the same as this Jadaron. Is Preston John. This Jadaron, king of the islands, has a son. Well, he's the son of Atan, king of the islands. And, man, we can start going on that trail. You're going to find a lot of interesting things. <laughs> because he's also the son of David Bragram Tum and Princess Rusa Dan of Georgia. Come on, man. <laughs> so this Jadaron, Prince Jadaron, is also the son of a David. So like I said, the David goes back further and further, like Salima. And Princess Rusadan, the father of Jadaron, king of the island. And he's the father of David Sauston, who's married to Queen Tamar. Come, I told you, man, best dismount of all time. Let's go. It's also a Rusadan. 
of Armenia. Who they say is the wife or ex-wife of David the fourth. Interesting. 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 And I believe David the fourth is the father of Queen Tamar. I mean, let's put this all together. <laughs> I right, put the story together, man. Prince George of Georgia. She's the mother of Princess Tamar. Whoa. Okay, so this Ruth Sedan of Armenia, bring them in, right? We're talking Persia. <laughs> Is also the mother of Princess Tamar. Daughter of David, who? The fourth, like we just said. Princess Tamar, daughter of David the Fourth of Georgia, Bracantioni. So, when we look at the House of Georgia flow, when we start digging even deeper into it, all these are titles of Judah. All these are titles of Judah. All these are titles of Judah. Rusadan, Dawi, Islands, and Oset, Jadara. Georgia, <laughs> all this is Judah. Even as tomorrow, when you look at her mother, she is Burduka. Burduka. Sounds like that Mandalorian, uh, one of the Mandalorian females, Burdukan or Burdukan, something like that. Burduka or Gorunduk of Ossetia. So she is the daughter of Kuda, <laughs> king of Ossetia. Now this Ossetia plays the same as the Allen plot. Allen's play. Back to the Rusa dance, right? Back to Tamar. Mother of Rusa Dan, mother of Tamar. Let's go. And we'll tear way more into this, you know, I just told y'all we <laughs> surfing the wave, man. We got to, you know, because then in the New World Encyclopedia, they got a whole breakdown of the Bragantoni dynasty, and they're not going to give you all the information you just got for these last couple of hours, right? But we impressed them 117. This is the 117th installment. The Bragantoni dynasty was the ruling family of Georgia. Their ancestors, their ascendancy lasted from the early Middle Ages until the early 19th century. 19th century, man. Now we in the 1800s again, the cool say. In the modern usage, this royal line is frequently referred to as the Georgian Bragatids, a Hellenized form of their dynastic name. Right? Because they Greeked up the place. The origin of the Bragantoni dynasty is disputed as the time when they first appeared on Georgian soil, traditional of course, it's going to be disputed because they done changed history. They done made this some European thing when this is an American thing. Traditional Georgian history, history writing begins the Bragantoni dynasty or chronology in the 6th century and relates the family to earlier, earlier dynasties. The history of the dynasty is inextricably bound with that of Georgia. They began their rule in the early 9th century as presiding princes in historic southwest Georgia, historic Georgia, where's that? In the adjacent Georgian marshlands reconquered from Arabs, Arab who? Arab proper or pretender? Subsequently, they restored in 888 the Georgian kingdom, which prospered from the 11th to the 13th century, back to the 1200s, my name, bringing several re regional policies under its control or polities. This period of time, particularly the reigns of David the Fourth and his grand great granddaughter Tamar, is celebrated as a golden age in the history of Georgia, the era of empire, 
military explorers remarkable achievements in culture after the fragmentation of their unified feudal state in the late 15th century the branches of Bracketoni house ruled the three breakaway georgian kingdoms so before we got the three uh tamil dynasties right the cholas the karas you know what i mean now we got the three georgian dynasties, kingdoms cartley the Kaketi, the Emirati. All right, now again, phantom the duplication. You got the Panians, the Cholans, the Cars over here, the Cartleys, the 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 Cartleys, right back to the car flow, the Kaketis, the Emiratis, until the Russian annexation in the early 19th century. The dynasty persisted as an imperial Russian noble family. Why? Because they're connected to David, the real Rus of Russia. That's why the new Russia had to get rid of this situation until the 1917 February Revolution. Whoa. So we got to dig on that revolution because what did it got to do with copper colored people? The establishment of the Soviet rule in Georgia in 1921 forced many representatives of the family to relocate to Western Europe. We're talking about Spain, we're talking Italy, we're talking France. So origins, it says, according to the family legend, taken down by the 11th century, Georgian chronicler Sambat Davitsis, and supplied much later by Prince Vakhusti Bragantoni, with chronological data, the ancestors of the dynasty traced their descent to the biblical king and prophet David. Did you know he was a prophet? Did you know David was a prophet? <laughs> Priest king, right? And came from Palestine around 530 CE. Tradition has it that of seven, seven refugee brothers of the Davidic line, three of them settled in Armenia. This is where you got the roots of dance of Armenia. But where's the real Armenia? Where's Persia? If Persia's in Mexico, where's Armenia? If Persia's in Mexico, where's Armenia? <laughs> and the other four arrived in Kartli, all right? A major Georgian region also known as Iberia, uh-oh. Or are we talking Eber like Jokta, like Yucatan, where they intermarry with the local ruling houses and acquire some lands and hereditary possessions. And we'll get more, but you see that they're coming directly to the David line. They're not playing on this stuff, man. You see, they're coming directly to David line. They're coming directly to the biblical King David, the prophet David, right? Right. They're coming directly to press the child. And this exilarch David the Sick is linked in with Queen Tamar, whose sister is the Rusa Dan. Whose father's David the Four? We got the Osetia flow. These are all royals of the islands and the Osets. This is the house of Judah. We're talking about King David. And we're talking about Queen Tamar, who has a lot of familiarities with this Bathsheba, which is a title. As Sheba means daughter of the oath or daughter of the seven, like the seven cities of gold, like Shambhala is Sheba. Come. When you're talking to Africa, Ethiopia is Abyssinia, mixed multitude right here in India Superior or America. Come. Daughter of David the fourth. And she marries David Sauslin the six. Titles the Vedic Khan. Biblical king and prophet David is who the Georgians trace back to. I know. We're talking the lions of Judah. Almost there for the dismount, my knockers, man. We're going to take it on home real quick. Let's, let's belly flop in the a couple of previous uh, Prester flows talking about this Queen Tamar, 
A little bit on this David flow, man. Let's go. A little bit on this Uriah flow. Uh, let's go. Hey, halawa to the cons. Because you are the function. Wow, wow, wow. I'm, I'm glad we got the records. Because <laughs> when we got the records, you already know it, man. We got the receipts. And the water continues. And the drop don't stop. The investigation continues. And hey, any of my noggins that's right here, for the dismount, uh, go ahead and uh, press put another twos, be number nine much, in the much comments. Let me know you in the nine code. Uh, Let me know you nine above or what, that you are the spiral because the nine is the spiral, man. <laughs> My naga, you, you have manifested as the function, the investigation of 60, yourself. 60, man. I think it's Ain't 60. Now let's listen in. Um, the press the pack twos will be to big drop. You know, Thirty. You know press the sixty. Yeah, yeah, David. Do it for every the every ten. Press the giant drops. We'll make it happen. You know. La hua. La hua. Put them joints on it. Put the videos on it. Yeah. Press the sixty-seven. And maybe you know what? Uh, do like some of uh, belly fly. We just. Just belly flop into each one. That'd be pretty dope. Like get like three minutes from each one. That'd be pretty dope. Uh -oh. First, let me get a couple of links. Maybe we'll just do that. You know, help me fall back a little bit. It is the Shabbat. I should be jumping link all day. Let's go. But when you talk about Uriah, 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 you gotta say which one. Uriah is they guilty of the sin? A murder. We know he got bodies on bodies in war. <laughs> David slices and dices. He's a warrior, right? But is David guilty of murder? Or is it something the scribes wrote to make Jesus, JC, look way more perfect than he actually is and make uh, Dawi and everybody you know, look imperfect, make Moses look imperfect, right? For some reason, he can't see the promised land. All that work Moses put in, and they kind of slide over the reason why he can't see the promised land. All that work King David put in, and it kind of just... And it kind of just muddy up with a story about... Slaying a man because he wants his woman Tamar or Sheba who's bathing on the rooftop, exposing herself. Now she's just the harlot. The harlot <laughs> gets her pregnant, brings Uriel or Yuri back from the battle. To try to get him drunk so he could lay with his wife to cover up the sin so that he could say it's his child, not you know, all this premeditated shit. Then kill him. <laughs> Come on, man. You think I would man, annoy him? that frequency? That's a premeditated murder, man. That's adultery to the, to the nth power. And now you gotta try to trust the king that's capable of this type of adultery. This type of murder, premeditated. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm rocking with this one. <laughs> Mac, Mac, Mac said she don't, don't believe, believe it, man. Mac, Mac, Mac said, said, you know, this is not Jack City. City. He's, He's not, not guilty, guilty of this transgression. So how far did they go when the kingdom was split? When I say he's you know, the tip of perfection. You know, we're just saying, was he guilty of this murder? Because when you look at this, this Uriah starts lining up with David Salsman, ex-husband of Tamar. 
you know, know we're pressed to 67, 66, you know what I'm saying? Tomorrow, after Uriel dies, when Uriel dies, she she marries David, right? So she becomes David's, David's queen. Now, why did Uriel die? Was it according to what Second Samuel says that he was put in the front line and that was it? Boom, boom. Or did Uriel cause a rebellion as lining up with this Georgian history? This is what's not being taught to us. Who is the king of the islands? Let's go. This is Preston John Jadron. Who are the islands? Oh, boy. Okay. Let's see how the upload is so I can uh, delete some of this heavyweight store for no use. Yes, you get, get the drop. I'll leave the link. link. You know what I'm saying? saying? So at least you got, got that drop. drop. If you, you want, want any, any of the drop, drop links, links, I know. Hey, belly flops, go. You're his father and tomorrow's father and then, and then you end up turning on. Oh, try. Yuri will become a pawn in their hand. Also join and set out to conquer Georgia, which is connected with the tribes of Israel. All right, this time tomorrow. Look, man, get the drop. So he gathered a huge army from the Greeks to which some Georgian Tsarinas, ill-wishers, also joined and set off to conquer Georgia. Now, this is not the biblical story, but this is Uri or Uriah <laughs> in the Bible, who's this damn near perfect man. And they made him you know, look so pitiful. You know what I mean? But in this story, he's gathering an army to fight and conquer Georgia. But you had to put it together that Georgia is Judah. <laughs> and this is why Tamar had to pop off against Uri or Uriah. And this is why David had to pop off against Uriah. Did he kill a man? Did he murder an innocent man? <laughs> or is he innocent as he was protecting the queen? Hmm. Things that make you go. Hmm. I mean, what's the real spill? Do you see clearly? R herself led the troops. So oh, just because she didn't help out later after the Union of David, David maybe she stopped, stopped fighting, fighting in these particular wars. You know what I'm saying? saying? After the Union of David, maybe she was able to fall back a little bit. bit. You know what I'm saying? saying? But before that, that Tamara herself led the troops, showing remarkable talent for the commander and defeating her husband on the outskirts of Tbilisi. She defeated Yuri. Yuri, Uriah. So Tamara led the troops and defeated her husband, Yuri. In the script. <laughs> you got something totally different, right? You got David putting on the front lines and all this stuff, right? But Bathsheba or Tamar and David were already in love. And this arranged marriage happened, you know what I'm saying, by their families, Yuri's father and Tamar's father and them. And then Yuri ended up turning on the whole tribe. Damn. So they already had a thing going on. Then she gets promised to this Yuri who then gets covetous of the whole kingdom raises an army against Tamar and this is why they had to deal with Uriah but that's not the biblical account right well, yeah they're not going to connect you know Tamar with Uriah they're not going to connect you with the drop <laughs> they're not going to connect you with the uh, Bathsheba the city's gold everything to things learned by what I call little India because we know that we are in India superior God, God. Indeed, we we are in India's period. 
All right, so we went from press to 68 to press to 66 when we talked about the Queen Maka tomorrow. Uh oh. KKC. Let me get to go. Yeah. Enjoy the spot, chilling in my row. Yeah, that's Clan Ross at your front door. All right, man, we're just getting the drop, right? Belly flop. To the Eli U project. The Eve's issue, Sheba is Eve's. It's the same name, the same title, the Eve's and Sheba. Ellis proposed that it was Makah Tamar II, who later returned to visit her son in Jerusalem. Wow, so this link is breaking down at the Queen of Sheba. Ellis writes that the name, the title, Queen of Sheba, and Solomon's mother, Bathsheba's name, are the same. Queen of Sheba is Bathsheba. So David married a Bathsheba title. And Solomon also married a woman under this title, like a David title or a Sheba title is a title or a Shambhala title. She was both daughter and wife to King David. Uh, I mean, again, they're getting their, their, uh, <laughs> they're getting their uh, drop in a, in a crux, you know what I'm saying? But, they're trying to tie this together, man. So, according to Ellis, Bathsheba's a firm name was Maka Tamar II. Ping pow. So, we have a Bathsheba connecting with Tamar directly. And she became second chief wife of King David and was Solomon's mother. She was David's daughter by her namesake mother, Maka Tamar I. Who disappeared after the death of King David. She had strong genetic maternal links to the priest kings, Prester Johns of Thebes, and like we just got, Thebes is Sheba's or Sheba. Can't. <laughs> but Naga, I can't make this up. But the biblical texts say that the Queen of Sheba visited King Solomon, not David. Well, now you see that the Queen of Sheba is also Bathsheba. And those are two different Shebas, and they want to make them one daughter, one wife. Now, those are two different Shebas in the same line of Shebas. We're talking high Amazon queens. Huh? Huh? Let's go. Are they now suggesting that Solomon was visited by his mom? <laughs> Hi, Jackson. Golly, now they, Hi, Jackson. Now they got more incest. Hi, right? Jackson. <laughs> Hi, Jackson. So this... Now the Sheba that visits Solomon was his mama. And now he married his mama. Now she married his Come on, man. These are some sick, twisted bastards, man. I, I'm, I'm just jumping into some of this, you know what I'm saying? Just because we in 66, I think we're ready for to approach, you know, necromancy at its highest form, my nugget. You know, they'll do anything to destroy Con David, you know. And you'll see why. You talking to Preston. <laughs> who oh who was Preston John and that was back in 66 and we almost had 120 man that was like 60 Preston Johns ago man love to drop nation we keeping that water flowing next time we'll pick up right here in the Royal House of Georgia man this is a 56 page uh, document you know what I'm saying uh, PDF it's gonna break down everything you need to know about the House of Georgia that we can tie and they like to pick it up right here in the golden age which is right Talking about the Tamar flow, you know what I'm saying? So I love it, man. I love it, man. Because we know we're talking David, the the knighthood, the nobility. We know, we know we already got that they trace their lineage to King David, the prophet David, they say, right? Yeah, iconoclasts are images. We know we're talking Nagas. <laughs> And again, the origin of Georgia, medieval monarchy established in 975 by the Baccarat III. Now you got the Bragantion dynasties, flourished during the 11th and 12th centuries, which is exactly when Preston John was popping off, and exactly when Genghis Khan was invading Preston John. The so called golden age of the history of Georgia, it fell to the Mongol invasions of the 13th century. It fell to Genghis and them. The real kingdom of Georgia fell. In the same Western Shishia, Western Shi, the same invasion of the Almex, the same invasion of the royal house of King David, is exactly when the kingdom of Georgia fell. Huh? 
the Turko Mongols. Don't the Moors call themselves the Turks? It's some more and more war. We got them in another body bag, y'all. Another body bag, man. We're going to pick up and press the 118 with this body bag. Talking about the kingdom of Georgia. Oh, yeah. Let's go. This link also is going to connect you to the royal sovereign houses of Georgia, the origin of the Bagratids, to the biblical King Dawi. King David's all over the place. You just didn't know it, right? Yeah, you didn't know it had a Persian factor, a Mongol factor, Termitai, Termari, Ottoman. Ottomans, don't the Moors call themselves the Ottoman Turks? Come on, man. So we know we're being invaded. The more time George being invaded. Successor of the ancient cold cheese. That's a whole nother drop coming back to the royal house. The three royal branches maintain the family unity, each of them being considered as a cadet branch of the two others, right? The three Indias, Managa, which sometimes result in not in brotherly relationships, but in claims and counterclaims, war, cartilinia was the premier Georgian kingdom which premiership still belongs to the corresponding branch of the house but its kings had no family jurisdiction over the two other branches and there was no sole headship within the house of Bergrat. so here we go it's a fight for the con it's a game of thrones it's a game of thrones we get back in the house of george i'm just letting you know what we got all right very interesting drop we were talking about that Susan, Susan, Susa last drop. Go get Preston 116. And there's a whole Susan connection with South Carolina. So when they're bringing the Susans on us, you know, we got to dig on the Susan, South Carolina. But, of course, we're just talking the car. And the Carolina is the Carolina because they say it's a Susanian dynasty. House of Susan. Back to Persia or Persia or Mexico, right? And the Zoroastrian high priest of Pars, which is Persia or Paris or Paris. Yep. It's all happening, man. <laughs> Shasha, the Shahanshah, yeah, man. Seoul region, head of state, head of government, of the empire. All right, man. So all this is connected. The Susanian might have a Susan Kwa connection with the Kara, South Kara, and the North Kara <laughs> right here in America. Yeah, the Susan. Susanian flow. Ah, they went to the emperor of the Tang. Remember the Tang and the... And the uh, you know, Muslim kind of had a connection. The Tang and Islam kind of had a connection going on last time. We talked about the Sos Ruko when we talked about David Sosland and the, the the derivation of the name Sosland. They also connect to the Sos Ruko, huh? Like the Susan, <laughs> Sos Ruko, Sus Raquo. Whoa, Sus Raquo kind of has a similar sound to the. Uh, Sasan Kwa. I can't make that up. That's interesting. The Sasanian dynasty. The Sasan, Susan. We got there by just, you know, digging on the Sasanian Empire or the Iran Shah. Again, this early Muslim conquest. Conquesting on the Arab proper. Named after the house of Sasan, which is where they gain the Susa flow. Huh. And the sauce ruko and the sauce ruquo or qua reminds us of the susan qua and the susan requa. Huh. Remember, they're saying uh, in Kirkazian mythology. It was the Narts. So we'll dig on these Narts as well. Maybe next time we'll talk about Kingdom of Georgia, a little bit of these these Nart legends, man. These Nart legends, which are just legends of heroes. All this connects to heroes, they say. Kirkasian is like the Kirkasani flow we got, right? Kirkasani, <laughs> Kirkasian, which is 
which means sword, man. Hit, heat, burning, fiery sword. It's the Kirkasani hit. Is Soruko. Soruko is the sauce line. So this David sauce line of Georgia. Let me dig on this house of Georgia flow. This sauce line is Sosruko or the fiery sword, my nugget. Huh? <laughs> the fiery flaming sword. The fiery, right? The Sarah flow. And it said it's a Kirkasanian war. Kirkasian war. What's it got to do with the Kirkasani flow? Sword. Hold up, man. Kirkasani, right? Okay, okay. For the dismount. For the dismount. Kirkasani. I said, I said Kirkasani, right? My nag, I'm saying it's Jacob Kirkasani that connects with the Daniel Cole that connects with the Alam and David. This Kirkasani seems to have a lot to do with this Kirkasian flow. Store. Other variants are Akaz. All right, and all these other ones. We talked about the Yosets and Alice, right? In Ossetian, the name Sauslan etymologically came from Turkey language Nagoy Susla, like Nag, right? Like Nag. Susla, to look menacing. Huh? Like the one with the deadly glance to see, to look, boss. Are you seeing? Are you looking? Clearly, are you looking menacing? Like a sousla? Like a sousla? Very sore? Are you, you know, seeing clear? That when you look menacing, you are the one with the deadly glance because you are the drag. <laughs> you look menacing. You're a true Sasla. Now you got the deadly glance. You're a Sosruko. To look menacing is to have the deadly glance. That's why we gotta dig on the islands and the Yosets and this fiery sword of the Sosla. And the Susla, to look menacing, is the one with the deadly glance, Khan, is the dragon. So we keep <laughs> going to the Davis, back to the dragons, to the fiery, to the to the Syrah. We're talking cold keepers with that fire. Etymologically, right? <laughs> A setting in terms, Sosri, regional variant, Sosri Quo, cognate in the Persian, Sezavar, meaning he who is worthy. So you got to be worthy of that daily glance. You got to be worthy of that fire. That sword got to cut if you're talking Kirk Asani and Jacob in there. Yeah. You got to be worthy to have the dragon. Let's go. I'm talking Georgie. So you're talking Kingdom of Georgia. You're also talking Genghis Khan. Who wants to steal the title of Georgie like he stole the title of Khan, like he stole the title of Preston, like, like he stole the title of David, the Rus. Yeah. David's stealing it all. Love to Anatoly for the Manko. David's stealing it all. The Chronicle of the Tsar's Khans is from chronologia.org. From 1276 to 1600, according to the new chronology by Fernando and Navasky. Navasky. They say the Russian horde, 14th to uh, 16th century, in the Tsar Grad Kingdom of the 11th to 13th, are crucial for practically all ancient Scaligarian history. And this is who's responsible for pushing your timeline back in at least three major chronological time shifts. 333 years, 1,054 years, and 1,778 years. 
Scaliger and Batavius. And this quote unquote ancient history is phantoms and duplications. And here's a list of main phantom reflections of the Russian Tsar Khans. So some of the main reflections that this researcher, and it might be something, it might be nothing, but they're comparing all these Russian Tsar Khans from 1276 to 1600. The ancient Russian history, 13 to 10 to 13th centuries, Habsburg Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, 10 to 13th century, ancient kingdom of Israel, ancient kingdom of Judah, third Roman Empire, second Roman Empire, the Tsar Rome, the zero Byzantine Empire, the first half of the Byzantine Empire up until 980 AD, the first half of the third Byzantine Empire up until 1300 AD, the history of the medieval England up until 1327. You, you, you see it? these reflections? Either you're talking 12th, 13th century, or they're going to bring you to the you know, 9th century, 10th century. 333 years is the first major chronological time shift. So that 300 year, you see it reflected even right here. And then the 1800 years you see reflected when they push it back to 300 AD, when they really are in what? 1300, maybe even 17, 18th century, my nine. As well as the Carolingian Empire, because you're just talking Kara again. The Mongol Empire and the legend of Genghis Khan, who becomes Preston John? Because <laughs> Genghis Khan had to become the Preston. He had to steal the title. He became Preston John. What does this chronicle show written in the 13th and 19th centuries? One, the Mongol Empire and the Russian Horde are the same project, which has its climax around the 14th and 15th centuries with the expansion of Christianity from Paris, Paris to Beijing by the Franciscans. After between the 16th and 18th centuries, their dynasties are separated. Two, at the moment of maximum expansion and decree proclaims, quote, all subjects are commanded to live in peace with one another and the powerful are forbidden to oppress the poor, quote, and, end quote, until then the great Khan is the only sovereign, Khan of Khans, and his word is the will of heaven and earth. Three, the chronology of this expansion corresponds to the chronological, chronological reconstruction promoted by the new chronology. Four, King David of Israel is equated to Genghis Khan and this one to Preston John of the Indies who moves to Ethiopia. Well, we know Genghis Khan had to steal the title Khan, but the King King David is the great Khan, not Genghis Khan. King David is the great Khan. Genghis had to steal the title great Khan. But King David of Israel is equated to the great Khan, is equated to Preston John. I told you, I don't have to go far to, co to find the connection between Preston John, the great Khan, and King David. We don't have to go far <laughs> to connect Preston John to King David. It's everywhere. We, how many documents is this? How many documents is this? King David of Israel is Preston John, is the great Khan of the Indies or India Superior. The Mongols were descendants of the Magi. This Mongol means the great one. Yeah, the Mongolian project is the same of the people of Israel. The Mongols are Israelites. <laughs> the great ones are Israel. And Canaan, which one, is the whole world. Anion, my naga. Anah, do you see clearly? You got the deadly glance. It's, it's deadly for them. It's violent for them. But you see clearly. You got the dragon. The dragon is deadly and violent for them. But for you, it's your light. It's the rising of the dragon. It's the Kundalini. It's the Kum, right? It's the Kundalini. Genghis Khan would be King David. Nah, Genghis Khan stole the title Khan. There are people of God that Christianity becomes theirs and they are at the root of the major spiritual school of the world. That is why Mongols and the Israelites are the people of shepherds. Preston John becomes around 15 and 17th century the great Khan that moves to Ethiopia or he's the Abyssinian.
Yeah. He's the Abyssinian. At the time when the Edic proclaiming the rule of peace and justice for all is decreed, it is the message of the New Testament. Hijack City. And at the main sacred books, the Presta John appears then from the hand of the myth of Jesus, Krishna, and Buddha. Yeah, they got to write about them in their own way. <laughs> and is their common origin. Yeah, the origin is the priest king, is the Mongol, the great one, King David. The Magi of the East would be the Khans who have blessed the appearance of the anointed that they spread themselves so they got the magi in the new testament the ethiopia and all that coming to to see the baby jesus no we're talking joshua because <laughs> Miriam is the mother of joshua <laughs> anna hannah let's go Miriam, my naga <sighs> and king david is equated to the great God is Preston John. La Wa. It's steady water flowing over here. You know, this is a, a big step that, you know, we've been taking together, man, side by side. The cons have been united. They want us to forget that we've been at war <laughs> more and more the whole damn time. The war of the Kumse was your last major stand. And all these Indian wars afterwards in the 1800s, Cherokee, Cherokee, Texas Indian, Indian, Seminole Creek. All these are the same war, the same Shikramagua, Cherokee that they rode up on that took the front line for the first 20 years fighting the hijack. Dragon Canoe leading the charge. Dragon Canoe to Kumse fighting in the midst of all this. Then becomes Priest King and continues the charge to get the hijack off your land. The story of the Georgians and the Kirkusanis, the Bragantonis, the Rusadans, they culminate right here. This is why we're asking who or who is Preston John. This is why we seek in Hawaii. And David the Khan forever. Because Israel's gone a long time without a priest, without a king. In the Holy Land of Tarzan. Hosea 3. For the children of Israel shall sit solitary. Verse 3. Thou shalt sit solitary for me many days. You shall not play the harlot. For the children of Israel shall sit solitary many days without a king. So you never even thought about kingdom of Georgia. <laughs> President John and the Cholas, the Panians, the Cars. The Mongol flow being the Israel flow, the Russian flow being the Rus flow, the indigenous India superior <laughs> being Asia major. You've been, you've been asleep. What do you think is going to happen when you wake up? It's going to make sense? No, it's going to be crazy, man. You're going to be like, why am I doing this? Why am I worshiping that? Why, why my mama teach me that? <laughs> why did daddy teach me that? What am I teaching my children? We got to come back home, man. This is why we are in the 117th installment of Preston John, because we have returned. My Naga, all praise to Allah. Afterwards, the children of Israel return, man. Valley of Dry Bones coming back together, Ezekiel 37. We return, huh? 
and seek the creator personally, man. We seek our Hawa personally first and directly with no hijacks in between, no Christ, no Muhammad, none of that. We go directly to Hawa, most high over everything. We keep the code, we KTC, and to get that fountain of that, that living water, that's what the shepherd has. That's what the flock has to go to the shepherd who's been placed as one shepherd forever. As Hawa says in Psalms 89, my covenant is with David in the house, the seed forever. My mercy is forever for David's house, man. That's why they tying into David so much. Because the mercy is forever. The Baruch is forever. The covenant is forever. And you're going to return forever this time. And you're going to seek the creator and David your king. Who is the Khan. And shall come trembling. Trembling into Hawaii. And his goodness. The fat of the land. The fat of the blessings. The Baruch. Deuteronomy 28. You got Baruch going in. Baruch going when I'm blessed, you bless when you walk in, you bless when you walk out. Everything is blessed when you keep the code. When you seek Hawa directly and King David, David their king, then you come humble and trembling to Hawa, to the goodness in the end of days. Not the beginning, not the middle, but the end of days. This is Daniel 12. The books are being unsealed. Knowledge is abounding. In the end of days, you search for Hawa and David the cop. Who oh who was pressed to John? And why does India superior connect to this promised land where the British Museum placed Preston John in North America? In North America, 1530? Yeah. And why does America seem to connect to Tara? <laughs> Son. Hey, the investigation, my Nagas. The investigation continues. The water for surfing away with me, because you know I'm surfing away with you. To the worlds beyond the poles and infinity, my naga, we popping off. The gateways <laughs> are ours. Welcome back and welcome home. And never forget again that we connect to Hawa as we return. We seek the creator and Hawa has given us one shepherd forever. Allah Hawa, stay up. Suda, choose up, and the Wata, my Nagas, for taking this time, all this time, to dig on this, not just with me, but with your families, to spread the drop, to spread the frequency. And look at us now, man. This has been the 117th installment of the Preston John Investigation. Shalom, Khans. The water keeps flowing, the fire keeps burning. Allow. Oh, wow.